The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, uh, first uh, uh, midterm, uh, number two. That's, uh, if you look at the syllabus, uh, we have two midterms arranged. The first one is uh, in class. The second one is uh, taking home. And now you can see why it's taking home. Uh, there's problems uh, um, uh, would take time, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, uh, but the same when I think about taking home, I always thought of my own experience. So if I give you on Friday, you'll spend your whole weekend on it. So uh, um, what I am doing is I give you on uh, Monday at the end of the lecture. And uh, we'll come in uh, Wednesday at the beginning of the lecture. So uh, it's uh, a short pen, hopefully. Uh, any question? If you ask what are the problems, I, po I posted uh, examples. So my challenge is to make up the, pro make up the problems the next few days. That's solvable, OK? And uh, there are no problem I can go. Every time I have to think hard of what other problem I can make. Uh, that's reasonable. So uh, OK, any questions there? Or maybe you have a suggestion for problems. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, let's review what we've been talking in the last two lectures. We were solving the Boltzmann equation, look at the classical size effects uh, when the carrier, heat carriers, um, uh, mo uh, say collide with the boundary. So we took the simplest configuration, a thin film that has two surfaces. And uh, 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 two lectures ago, we discussed uh, when you have a heat flow along the film plane, where the, of course, the heat carrier is not just a parallel flow. Uh, say the random uh, velocity, it can go hit the boundary. At the boundary, they uh, diffusely scatter, or they uh, partially diffusely, partially specter, scatter. So, uh, and the second problem that we deal with uh, in the last lecture is uh, let's now have the uh, uh, heat transfer in the perpendicular direction. When I say heat, I hope now you agree, it's say I can do charge. I can do, say, uh, photon. I can do, uh, say, uh, molecule. And in fact, the uh, molecular uh, heat conduction is a, a more difficult problem, believe it or not. Uh, that's because if I do the gas molecule, uh, I have also a concentration gradient. So even the same material, right, uh, the higher temperature, uh, the, if you think about ideal gas law, and the density will change. So when density change, you also have a mass diffusion. Even in the same material, there's a mass diffusion. <coughs> that's an integral equation. So you actually have to solve two integral equations together for the molecular case. For Folon, we didn't, we say, uh, as it's just to say, it's more, we're not considering the density variation, so it's one integral equation. And the difference is, in this case, the temperature is inside the integral, right? So even we use the um, uh, relaxation time approximation, the Boltzmann equation itself is a first order differential equation, but at the end, because the transport is long local, Right. Yeah, when I say long local, I mean the heat flow at any point is not just a local gradient. It depends on the temperature history directly integration through the whole domain. So that's the non local transport, and then we have to solve the integral equation. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, rarefied gas flow, we didn't solve this problem. Um, but I discussed uh, if you go to solve, it's sort of the combination of the two because uh, I have a uh, flow in the x direction. I have a source term that's a function of x. But also I have the boundary that constrain 
uh, uh, the molecules and the boundary scattering. So if we solve this, I discuss the loosened minimum phenomena and uh, the velocity distribution now has a slip. So there is a discontinuity of the molecules at the wall. Okay? And uh, uh, I want to say that this discontinuity, so normally if you say in 2005 or all the undergraduate uh, fluid mechanics heat transfer, we always say at the wall the temperature is continuous, the velocity equals the wall uh, velocity, that's the long sleeve boundary condition, right, for both temperature and uh, for uh, velocity. And the reality is there is always a sleep. That sleep happens over one molecular mean free path, right? So now the, if we, let's think about the air molecule mean free path, 100 nanometer, right? And if I have sleep over 100 nanometer, but if I deal with a meter scale, so that sleep is too small to be actually observable or of any significance. So this is always happening. And uh, um, uh, except that in the case of a liquid, I uh, will move on to the liquid version. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the uh, what we deal with, uh, uh, more or less in the rigorous in terms of solving the Boltzmann equation on the relaxation time approximation. And of course, the difficulty is now even for this simplest problem like heat conduction, you realize that uh, we have to go solve an integral equation, which is uh, uh, by no means trivial, right? So uh, what I'm going to uh, introduce next is uh, some approximate ways just attribute all the effects to the boundary, to the interface. So we'll use diffusion approximation using Fourier law in the inside the domain, but at the boundary, I gave a sleep boundary condition. So how I should derive that sleep boundary condition. And I want to uh, actually say, want to show you a few papers I wrote on this, and it turns out uh, uh, every field has this sleep boundary condition. Uh, in the radiation, there's the so-called Daisler jump boundary condition. And uh, in fluid mechanics, there's a first order sleep, second order sleep. And uh, in heat conduction, I mentioned there's a temperature jump when we solve the, heat, uh, say the perpendicular heat flow, right? And uh, uh, in electrical uh, field, uh, there is also uh, interfacial resistance, electrical resistance. So this is all sort of related to what is this sleep, okay? And, uh, uh, and I'll make more comments uh, when we go to look at these papers. But uh, the diffusion approximation plus boundary sleep right so what I'm saying is a diffusion approximation of course is what the, we've been talking in chapter 6 that's how we derive Fourier law uh, Ohm's law and uh, all, all those uh, uh, continuum uh, equations and uh, what I want is uh, use this diffusion approximation. So the way I derive the product diffusion is the distribution function F, right, equals F0 minus tau Vx dF0 dx, right? So this is a, uh, I, I'm not writing the fourth term. For electron, you have to write the fourth term, right? So this is the one that I will use to derive the Fourier law. DF0 dx is DF0 dt, dt dx, right? So what I'm going to do is the idea is that I'm going to use this, assume my, this uh, uh, small deviation from equilibrium, this distribution function apply to every domain right to the interface, okay? So uh, here I have uh, a boundary between two material, one and two, and uh, say on um, the one side, I have distribution function, right? So uh, F1 equals F01 minus tau1 
v x one d f zero one d x right. So this is a uh, on the first side. On second side, you can write the same f two equal f zero two tau v x two d f zero two d x. So we're assuming that it's valid to the boundary. How uh, say? Of course, this is an approximation. I don't have a good justification. In fact, it's a uh, it's uh, not uh, so. It's only you can say okay. Maybe in the case of Nusen number is not very large, right? Then you can say most of the region is still diffusion dominated. But turns out this actually work out pretty wide range of Nusen number in many cases. And uh, uh, then I'm going to do uh, the heat flux, right? So if I do heat flux, I can do particle flux, any flux. But uh, let me write the heat flux. So the heat flux, and if I think about the inside diffusion, just think about the physics, right? This is an inside domain. We say this is a deviation. So what it means, the transport is in the same material. What diffusion really means? The distribution function F0 is isotropic, so it's a sphere, right? And then say I have a small deviation, and if I, my heat flow is in this direction, so I have in the forward, I have a surplus in the backward, uh, backward because the velocity is negative, I have a def deficiency. It's really, we emphasize is this region, that's the surplus, and this deficiency, this two part, that contribute to the left flux. F0 itself, when you integrate, there is equal amount of heat going forward, the backward. There's no left flux in the same material, right? But things will be different when I go to the interface, because the F0 in the, this first media and the F02 in the two media could be different. So uh, now I do the left flux will be, uh, so again, I write start with my summation of all the modes. Uh, in this case, is uh, what's the less flux across the interface is uh, all the ones that go forward and that could transmit, right? They'll, I'll have to multiply by the transmittance from one to two. So uh, I say, okay, I do my typical polarization, kx, ky, kz. This is a side one, so everything I put into side one. Right. That's a, I, again. I'm summing my my quantum states, and the v x one. So this is a v x one. Say v x one must be positive, right? That's going from left to right. So that means my k x one. That's a v vector. Must be larger than zero. Right. The wave is going from left to right. And uh, h bar omega. And I have F1, and uh, I have then say tau 1 to 2, right? The transmittance from 1 to 2. For example, in chapter 5, we know how to calculate transmittance. Fresnel formula for if you do photons, and similarly electron photons. So this is the half going from 1 to 2. And then I count the other half from 2 to 1. The difference gives me the left flux. We've always been trying to do this, right? So uh, the other half is, uh, uh, say, uh, P2 on the second side. And this is a kx2 less than 0. So this velocity is less than 0. So that I put the weight, uh, say, plus side. But say it really say ky2, kz2, and the vx2 in this case is negative, so the plus is really minus, so it's the lead difference of the two, right? So h bar omega f2 tau 2 to 1. Okay? So in a normal same material, I do not write it into two parts. In the same material, I just write it into my f, and I don't say this k, I sum up all both positive and negative k. 
And in that case, F0, like I said, cancel because it's isotropic. But in this case, if I substitute the F1 into here, and uh, F2 I didn't write into here, and uh, what I'll get is F01 and F02, and because the property on the two sides are not the same, you will not cancel each other. Right? And in fact, uh, if you go back to chapter 5, you are, you'll also see that in the chapter 5, we talked about the, the uh, uh, detail balance, right? So what I'll have is F01, if I just think about this term, F01 and modulated by tau 1, 2. The rest is V H omega F, let's say, that's the same. And uh, here is a V2, F02, uh, and H omega tau 2, 1. So I have this transmissivity from 1 to 2 and 2 to 1. I say you always have that detail balance you can write into one side only. That's what we did in chapter 5. Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a, the intermediate step mass. I just too much writing, so I'm not going to explicitly put it there. So what I want is you understand it. So that's the first term, right? F01 term. Now, this is tau Vx1 df0 dx. This is, a, say, the term when I write in the same material, I will get the, the thermal connectivity, right? If I write in the same material, I sum up is in the I have positive side and negative side. The two one is uh, say it's really the add up. The, the, this is not a cancellation now because this is a deficiency. This is the excess, right? You go to look at your mass. This two term actually because the velocity is reversed is a summation. So, but in this case, well, I'm doing half only k x one, right? So it's larger than zero. So this is only the sort of the, the this part, the surplus part. And when I do this term, it's only this part. Right? So I actually have a half Q modulated by transmittance because normally I in the same material I do not have this transmittance issue. So if you follow what I say, you put it in the mass, you convert it into the integral, what do you have? is so this what I'll get is sum up um, I'm still writing sum I, I haven't converted into integral Vx1 larger than zero you can still do your polarization uh, k uh, uh, so or either writing in k or in v ky1 kz1 and uh, h bar omega and tau 1 to 2 and uh, v x1 f01 minus f02. So I'm using the detail balance. Uh, the detail balance is uh, at the zero, uh, there, if there's no temperature difference, the left to right equals the right to left. So there's a relation between transmittance uh, of the two sides. So using that relation, I could write this detail value. So this is the uh, 0, 1, and uh, 0, 2 term. But I have this tau Vx df d0 term, as I said, is a half the Q, right? So if you do uh, I mean, uh, the math, you will say, OK, from 1 to 2 is uh, tau 1 to 2 prime Q over 2. And uh, 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 in fact, you can write that uh, this is a Q1. This is the flux on the first side, but the half, because uh, I'm only doing positive part. right? And of course, I also have this transmittance. And now I put a prime, because uh, when you do this Vx square, Vx1 square, there is sine theta square. So you integrate over angle. So this transmittance is an integrated, weighted transmittance. Sine square. There's sine square cosine. That's the when you convert into spherical coordinate. And similarly, I have tau two to one prime q to q two to one. Okay, that's on the other side. This is a, the diffusion. If you again, if you write the Fourier law, it will be minus k one dt dx. That's your q. Right? If it's the same material, that's what it would derive. 
So what I'm showing is now at the interface, right? Because of the asymmetry of the zeroth order term on the two sides, I don't have cancellation anymore. And this zeroth order term, if it's a, uh, 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 so uh, when I have a Q, I can put this two Q on the other side, combine, right? So I will combine this two, so Q1, Q2. Q1, Q2, if there's no interface heat generation, if there is interface heat generation, I have to be careful, right? If there's no interface heat generation, this Q1, Q2 should equal to each other because of the continuity of the heat flow. So all this is Q1 equals Q2 equals Q under no heat generation. So I plug in, I have one mass, one half tau, one two prime plus two one prime Q equals, now F01, F02, 01 let's say is related to temperature on the T1 on the first side at the interface. So I have this one is T1 and this is a T2, the temperature. Right, so I can use, if the t difference is not large, what I can write is uh, into, so this is write a delta T, and uh, V x1 larger than zero, and uh, V uh, say K y1, K z1, and uh, again you sum up the polarization, and uh, tau one to two, and the V x1 h bar omega d f01 dt. So I'm writing basic f01, f02. Uh, really what it means is f01 t1, this is f02, uh, f0 t2. Because uh, uh, if you think about Bose-Einstein distribution, it doesn't have anything other than h omega divided by kt, right? So itself is, uh, is just to say uh, they write it into difference, uh, differential times this temperature difference across the interface. So laterally, you see this derivation show me I have an interfacial temperature drop because of the a symmetry of my distribution on the two sides, right? And in the, in the zeroth order term, doesn't cancel. And uh, uh, of course, this one, you can again convert your summation into integration. And this conversion, there is a slight difference. This is a tau one two. Here I have v x one, right? Here when I do q. I have Vx1, but also F1 have another tau Vx1. So that's a Vx1 square in the two Q. Vx1 square has sine theta square. Vx1 is just sine theta. So my, my averaging for this transmittance is actually slight different than averaging weighted in terms of angle weighting, right? And so I'm going to uh, write, so if you do this, what do you have? is uh, uh, you can write it into integral. This is zero omega max and uh, uh, h bar omega df01 dt and density of states on the one side. And then uh, what you have on this side is uh, uh, one half zero to one tau one to two mu d mu. So this is a what comes from this size, Vx1 has a size theta. And uh, mu to d mu, if the transmittance is one, right? If the transmittance is one, this gives me one half, mu d mu, right? So this is really one fourth. If I want to get this two times this, gives me the average transmittance weighted over this sine theta Vx1. So this is a, should give me one fourth. This is a, gives me the specific heat. Oh, I forgot here is V1. So what this one is really all together, I can write this as one fourth C times V, 
and times tau 1 to a different weight average in terms of angle. Okay? Here I use, say, prime, and there I use a double prime. Okay. So uh, what I have then, this one, if I write together, is uh, delta t, 1 fourth CV, and tau 1 to C1 V1 on the first side, and 1 to transmittance. Right? So this is a, a slightly different than what you had in chapter 5. Chapter 5, we did the interface thermal boundary resistance. And what they didn't have is this two term, right? But later on, I discussed, when I discussed uh, here, there's a difference between immediate temperature and equilibrium temperature. You look, go back to look at derivation. And in that case, is actually, you come back and you add these two sort of terms. So there's very similarity, except let's say there is a, a little bit difference in the angle, the weight itself, uh, because there, we did not consider this diffusion flux distribution. We did not consider F has this tau V deviation uh, uh, on, say, flux. OK. So uh, this is a, uh, the, what I say when I apply to an interface. I have a temperature heat flux and temperature jump. I derive a relation between flux and temperature discontinuity at the interface. And you can do, for each problem, you can apply similar strategy to derive this type of a jump boundary condition. And as I said, for radiation, there is one velocity, there is one. And uh, uh, I'll show the, some of the paper. It's also interesting, I remember. Uh, uh, after I arrived at MIT once, uh, there was a say, professor, Professor Probstein. He, uh, Ronnie Probstein, he came to my office. He brought me a paper. He said, take a look at this paper. I did a jump boundary condition and, uh, for photons. And it turns out that his paper was one year earlier than the, in the field of thermal radiation we call Dazzler boundary condition, photons. So he actually derived the same because he, is a, he was a fluid, fluid mechanics, right, if I guess. Right? He did an extension to radiation. So maybe it should be called the proof proof boundary condition. But in, this, in that field, it's called uh, uh, Dazzler. OK, what's the, uh, uh, why, uh, what's the convenience with this, right? So let's apply it. Uh, I'm going to deal with now the heat conduction problem. Let's say this is a medium one, two, three. I have a thin film sandwiched between two substrates, right? Two infinite substrates. Right? I have heat flow here, right? And in each region, now because I'm assuming the diffusion approximation is valid, so uh, uh, in each region I can use uh, K, let's say K2, dt dx, so that's the diffusion. But at the boundary, I know there is a discontinuity at the interface. And uh, there is also another discontinuity at the interface. So I can represent this as a three resistors, the interface resistor, the internal resistor, and uh, the uh, second interface resistor. Right? So uh, uh, let's say this is a, a T1. This is T1 prime, then this is a T2 prime, and this is a T2, uh, right? So because uh, at the interface, I have the temperature discontinuity between the two sides. And uh, 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 inside the material, because this is the uh, two, so I, I now Q for heat conduction along this direction, right? I have Q heat flow equals K2 t1 prime minus t2 prime divided by d. I'm applying the diffusion approximation right to the boundary. So that's my Fourier law solution, right? I have uh, standard thermal conductivity times temperature difference divided by 
the thickness. Right? And uh, 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 this is a flux, so I didn't do the uh, area. And then say at the one, so I have Q, I have then say T1 minus T1 prime. If we look at this, this is a Q, T1 minus T1 prime, that's the interface. And then I have uh, over uh, 1 minus tau 1, 2 prime plus 2, 1 prime over 2. This is the averaging over the angle. And uh, uh, I have then C1 V1 over 4 tau 1, 2 prime, uh, double prime. OK? And in fact, uh, it would be easier if I do the other side from 2 to 1 in this case. Because uh, here is my choice, right? I write 1 to 2 in terms of the property 1 to 2. I said if you use the, uh, uh, if you use the um, reciprocity, right, the detail balance, it's your choice whether to choose side 1 or side 2. And uh, uh, in this case, when I, after I read this down, I said, oh, it would be much easier if I do C2, V2, because K2 is related to C2, V2. Right? The thermal conductivity, K2, in the simplest form, right, we said as C2, V2, and the mean free pass 2. OK? So it would be easier if I do uh, 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 C2, V2. But uh, 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 so this is at uh, this interface. And this, the third interface uh, here, the second interface, 2 to 3, I can similarly write Q in terms of uh, the uh, temperature T2 prime minus T2. So at the end, if I measure the two temperature, depends on where you're measuring, right? If I'm measuring the temperature on the other side of this two medium, and uh, this, you could do your measurement, for example, a typical thermal interface resistance measurement is that people put a very long uh, material. They do a thermal couple at the, uh, one, two, three, and they measure temperature, and they extrapolate to the interface. Because it's hard to stick a thermal couple exactly at the interface. Right? So in this case, OK, so that's your extrapolate temperature. On the same side, that's your extrapolate temperature. And uh, then you, you say, OK, if I use this temperature to define uh, the temperature difference, I have this. Uh, I need to eliminate also T2 prime by similar the other interface. And uh, if I add this, uh, all this resistance together, so you will get uh, effectively, so at the end, if you say my Q equals uh, K effective thermal conductivity over D T1 minus T2, I'm using the temperature on these two sides. I say what's the interlayer effective thermal conductivity that includes the conductivity conductance inside the layer and the two interface resistance. I add this up together. What I'll have is a K effective thermal conductivity, Kb, the bulk. The bulk is just a K2 here. K2 equals this. If I take the ratio, and what I'll have is a 3D4 gamma. That's the, uh, you see here, gamma over D is the Lucent number for full on, right? And uh, 1 minus 1 half tau 1, 2 prime, tau 2, 1 prime, and uh, tau 2, 2 prime, double prime, plus 1 mass, one, uh, again, 1 half tau 2, 3 prime, tau 3, 2 prime, and uh, tau 2, 3 prime, and plus 3D over 4 gamma. So it's related to interface transmittance and is related to, uh, say, the ratio of the, uh, uh, say, thickness over mean free pass. OK? So uh, I, I, 
Oh, yes, thank you. So one thing that I can say that this term is uh, my addition there. Okay. And uh, I see this is an interesting subtle point is it really, this kind of addition make it very consistent itself with the temperature definition. Because the temperature in the Fourier law is based on uh, isotropic distribution. It's go in all directions, right? And uh, that immediate temperature, when we do, sometimes we say, OK, let's say this is incoming, this is incoming. Based on this incoming temperature, that's not uh, consistent with the Fourier law definition. Okay. So uh, one success of this addition is you look at the limit when there's no interface. Okay. When there's no interface, you should get the bulk thermal conductivity. Right? And uh, typically, say, so when no interface, that means the transmittance equals 1. So this is 1, this is 1, this is 0, this is 0. I go back to 1. Right? And uh, most other way, this term is not included. If you don't do a consistent temperature definition, and this will be uh, additional artificial resistance. So that's a uh, say uh, uh, success. Anyway, uh, there. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, today rather than sh look at the literature. I do want to just uh, show you some uh, a few papers. In this case, uh, I have to brag a little bit about myself. I wrote a few papers I want to show. Uh, hide the image, show image. So the best way to so I, this, I, uh, uh, when I was a graduate student, my advisor is a very wise man, and uh, he say, OK, the best way to, write a, to learn a subject is to write a paper. You want to work on a subject? Give you three months, write a paper on it. So that's the uh, uh, challenge that uh, uh, I thought that it's a, uh, it's a pretty good one, the uh, challenge. And it turns out. OK, so I wrote a paper on this before. And uh, uh, this was a paper. Uh, uh, so I know there is a boundary condition. I say there is a Diesler boundary condition. right? But the problem is the temperature is not the, in the photon. That's for photon transfer. Photon transfer, you measure a temperature by sticking a thermal couple. So that's a different temperature definition. So you have to be very aware of how you define, how is your experiment. So I use this strategy. I say apply. Basically, this is what I just shown here. Is you, do your, you do your summation, and uh, uh, you, uh, you convert uh, into integration. And you can do, uh, let's say, it depends on, you have to define temperature. You have to, if you do electron transport, you have to define your chemical potential. Okay, voltage or electrochemical potential is the same. You have because these are all thermodynamic quantities. And so I I uh, I took the same strategy and uh, apply for both electrons or photons. And uh, again, you have to be uh, uh, say aware what exactly you measure. In the case of electron, for example, you have metal semiconductor interface. You put an electrode there you will not be measuring the voltage exactly at the interface. You're actually measuring over the averaging of that metal. So um, uh, it turns out that I, uh, to do this, I check a lot of papers in electrical engineering. People do thermionic emission modeling. And uh, 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 of course, the thermionic emission, they are different. Some people, when they do thermionic emission, it's a layer inside the device. And they would, in that case, I see most of the paper actually use, to me, is the wrong formula. Because their formula will not approach the limit when there's no barrier between the layer. For electron transport, is the uh, potential barrier at the interface. 
that uh, cause reflection. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the sort of shock gate barrier situation when you have a metal, you have semiconductor, there is a, this is a Fermi level, and this is the electrical, so you, uh, from conduction band to vacuum, at the interface, the vacuum level is same, so the difference of Fermi level and the electrical affinity give you the shock gate barrier. And uh, 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 say so you can have two different semiconductor, also at the interface there's a barrier. And uh, I would challenge you, if you're interested, you go to read papers. And uh, people, electrical engineers have done a lot of modeling. And most of the time I just see those paper just stick in the thermionic emission formula and then into a device uh, and combine with diffusion equation as well. That's not consistent. Okay, maybe I'll, this, this is a say, hopefully electric engineer won't be offended you know, when I say this. Because that's the reality of Czech literature. Okay, uh, next one. So in fact, uh, when I originally wrote this paper, I had the uh, fluids there. Okay, the slip flow for velocity, rarefied gas. So, so I said, that's beautiful, right? You do uh, uh, electron, you do phonon, you also do molecule, right? And uh, then I asked a student of mine to check the paper. So I wrote the paper. Uh, I always try to write the paper a year. Uh, doesn't always happen, no. Um, but say, um, so the student came back and he was very careful. Uh, he's, uh, Chris James is a professor at Berkeley. He said, there's a sign problem there. Uh, I said, how could it be there a sign problem? I used the same strategy applied to fluids. And uh, I, indeed, I went, I couldn't find, there was indeed a sign problem. So the fluid there was not applicable. And it took me uh, a while, uh, and then we wrote another paper to fix that sign problem. And uh, uh, this was, uh, say, the uh, velocity slip, right? And this velocity slip, uh, what happens is the difference for the flow, the, for this case, is uh, uh, it turns out that you can use, again, so uh, as I said, the people did the first order slip, second order slip, and to me, that's always a math, okay? you do your expansion. You say, okay, distribution function, I expand the first order, and didn't work, let me expand second order, right? And uh, I see that's a, 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 just a purely math-based, not a physics-based argument. And in fact, uh, for radiation, there, this is written in the book, you can check book. There is an expansion of second order, and the trend is completely wrong. It's written even in the textbook, right? So because the, the, my argument is the Boltzmann equation is a first order equation. And then when you expand the second order, you're creating something strange. So I say, OK, I, I'm going to still use the Boltzmann equation, first order solution right to the boundary. But what I'm missing in the case of flow is, uh, say, there is a pressure driven term. That's the source of the loosened minimum I mentioned before, right? So uh, once I understand that part, we add this in back into uh, the, uh, the boundary condition. And uh, uh, here are uh, some comparison. OK. So what do we have here? This is velocity distribution and uh, normalized flow rate. So this is a, a consider Sersignani I mentioned. This is the Boltzmann equation solution. Right here is the inverse loosened number. So uh, uh, inverse is d over mean free path. Right. So that this one, uh, uh, this is the uh, when d is lar much larger than uh, the mean free path. So that's a continuum. Right. You see, this is the first order correction. So that's what the people. That's Maxwell did it. Maxwell did the actually the slip. Okay. And then didn't work at the loosen minimum is a loosen number about one. So there are people expand to second order. It do, does have the loosen minimum, right? But the, this is a much more over predicting. So uh, 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 I waited this uh, sort of in between. 
one. That's not perfect, but at least I'm in the right range. OK. So the point is, this is, a, say, uh, you need to understand the physics when you do uh, approximations. And uh, uh, one more paper I want to mention. So this is a, just a modified boundary condition. And the one that uh, I said, OK, let me go back and re modify the Boltzmann equation. OK, Boltzmann equation, the, 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 the headache is a uh, uh, phase equation, phase space equation, right? So you get the integral equations. And the Fourier law is a, a real space equation, so you can solve finite difference all that much easier. So I say, let me, uh, and also I mentioned before there, I don't believe this uh, uh, hyperbolic equation because the hyperbolic is the only time. It doesn't take up a space issue there. So one strategy I took is uh, this uh, split, OK? I say, well, uh, uh, this is a Boltzmann equation under relaxation time approximation. And uh, let me split the, the carrier inside into two parts. One part comes from the boundary. And when they go uh, uh, transport inside, there's a scattering, right? There's an in scattering from other direction or emission. There's also outgoing scattering. So what I did is, OK, the boundary term is just outgoing scattering. And that part, I say, I, it's a purely from boundary. So I can calculate, say, analytically uh, based on the uh, view factor uh, concept. And then the, the other part is this diffuse scattering. So I can rewrite it into a form that's similar to the Cantillon equation, but it's only part of it. So with that, I call this ballistic diffusive equation. And uh, 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 so there, this is the uh, solution comparison, right? This is a Cantillon equation. It has a, a it, it, the purpose of Cantillon equation is to try to solve the issue of temperature discontinuity. Uh, no, the infinite speed of the uh, heat, right? Diffusion, a parabolic equation. I said that if you have semi-infinite media surface a temperature uh, 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 change, the solution exponential decay means the infinite way is not zero, right? It's exponentially small, but it's not zero. That means it's the infinite speed. So the Cantillon equation is a wave type of equation, so there is a wave front. But the Boltzmann equation, the, this is Fourier law, this is Boltzmann equation, that's also the ballistic diffusive equation. It's closer. It doesn't have this uh, 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 artificial uh, Cantillon type solution. OK, so the story of this is I was happy. So I was going to, I wrote up the paper. And uh, the night before I submit, I said, let me go to check a radiation, right? Uh, because uh, uh, I, you just don't want to make an outrageous claim if other people are work on And so I went to check the radiation. And I found you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. And people write it down this. Uh, well, uh, most of the time when you do research, you'll find out that, that uh, uh, um, people uh, uh, have done the, uh, uh, so this is a done for photon by uh, this, this guy uh, off. And in fact, it's written in radiation textbook. I just, I teach radiation, I didn't read that carefully. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but that's a steady state, and this is a more general. For full long for heat conduction, you care about transient. OK. So a lot of things you can do with the understanding and intuition. And the best way to learn, like I said, you write a paper on it, you understand better. Let me continue now. And so this is the uh, chapter 7, which is about uh, the uh, classic or size effects. And uh, now I'm uh, moving to uh, the next chapter. Uh, what I'm, uh, I'm talking, going to talk is the coupled energy conversion and transport, right? And then we say why, uh, if you see this book, uh, where, why, where is the energy conversion? We say is a nanoscale energy conversion. And uh, 
So the couple of the So let's start chapter eight. So what uh, 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 this chapter deal with is really uh, think about when we think about energy conversion, right? Of course, we're familiar with uh, the steam turbine, all this. But microscopic is really carrier energy transform from one type of carrier to another form, right? From the photon to electron. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, let's say even jar heating, the electron raise the temperature uh, of phonon. That's the interaction of the carrier. That's the energy conversion, right? So microscopically, is really if I think about uh, uh, say uh, 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 light comes to an object, right? The first step of that energy conversion is light is absorbed. And that absorption either lift the electron from valence band to the conduction band, that's what I want, or it excite a phonon. And in the case of electricity, I don't like that, right? So that's your part of your energy conversion. Or when I have, say, a conductor, and I have electron flow in the material conductor, and what happens is that the electron interact with the phonon. And uh, again, say sometimes you want to minimize that, right? So you want a better electric conductivity. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, say for whether you want, uh, say if you want to get a useful workout, is a combination of this excitation plus the transport, right? Can you, if you excite uh, electron hole pairs? Right, say so you you say okay, my photon is energy energetic enough. I will leave a, a hole behind and get an electron here. And the question is whether you can extract out. Right, whether this electron can go to your electrode. If you go electrode, go to external node, you win. Otherwise, the nature, what they want is they are at a higher energy state. They want to go back. Right, since it tends to be lazy, minimal energy, and uh, as this go back could be uh, relax back to the bottom, and then relax back to the bottom, and they, now there is a gap, and they can go uh, relax through the gap by emitting light or by emitting phonon. Right, emitting light if you use laser, that's what you want, but for phonon, you don't want that. Right. So, um, so, so, so this is really when you think about energy conversion is how you can, say, steer these processes towards direction that you like to see. And, uh, uh, but say what I'm going to do is to give you a very brief uh, introduction. What's the mathematical tool to do it, right? It's still based on Boltzmann equation. But now let's look at the interaction, focus on interaction term. So if you uh, recall, in, uh, we talk about the briefly Fermi golden rule. What it says, uh, if I have, say, original uh, system, I have these uh, eigenstates I got from quantum mechanical solutions, right? And now I have a perturbation. I have a photon comes in, for example, and that create a perturbation uh, of the to the energy of the system. A Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, that's a perturbation on top of already the uh, the eigenstates, right? So the Fermi Golden Rule is okay. This is the initial states. This is the final states. That's the original solution, allowable solution. And then the uh, Fermi Golden Real Rule tells me the rate of that process is uh, 2 pi over h, uh, h bar. And uh, m, uh, say, initial to final scattering matrix delta of the energy, the final state energy minus initial state energy. Right, that's the Fermi Golden Rule. And the scattering matrix 
is uh, uh, related to the wave function of the final and the initial states and the perturbation Hamiltonian. So we have the scatter matrix equals the final state wave function, the interaction perturbation Hamiltonian, and the initial state, uh, uh, say, uh, wave function integrated over the volume of that interaction. Right? So what I want to give is one example. This kind of a scattering calculation extremely involved. And but say I want to use one example to say people have done a lot of work. And uh, if you want to look at it, uh, you should check literature. And uh, this one example, let's look at the electron phonon scattering. Right? Uh, so um, if you think about the how electron when it goes through a semiconductor, right? How electron gets scattered by photons. And any process you have to, okay, you have in the, I, I think I made those comments before physics and even in reciprocal space. Uh, also you have to go think about the real event, right? If you have a real world picture, real space picture, what's happening, then you can describe that in terms of the reciprocal space, just a math, mathematics. And if I think about, uh, say, uh, electron, uh, my picture before is, if you think about chronic panning model, I have periodic potential, I have, that solution will give me a band gap, right, for example. And of course, uh, uh, when I deal with the phonon, I have springs. So uh, the uh, band gap uh, for uh, this, uh, let's say, one-dimensional lattice depends on, of course, uh, the uh, lattice constant, right? And depends on the potential profile. Now, what phonon does is when your lattices vibrate, this lattice constant is changing, right? The lattice constant change, you create, uh, say, this fluctuation. Visually, you can think about that if my band gap depends on lattice constant, lattice constant is vibrating, so the electron, uh, say, band gap is changing there due to the lattice vibration. And that created the perturbation for the electron energy level and created the scattering of the electron. So let's treat this problem. And, uh, so the perturbation to the Hamiltonian, and in the 1D, let's say, okay, electron is close to the band gap, is a function of the lattice constant, and uh, the displacement um, uh, uh, of the each lattice point, right? So this will give you a delta A, and the mass of the initial steady state. So this is the, uh, uh, say, in the 1D, right? If I do a 3D uh, situation, I, I, do a, I can uh, do an expansion, right? So if I do a Taylor expansion, it's D E C, uh, D uh, A, D U, and D uh, X times A. So in 3D, this can be written as equals Z A and uh, the uh, divergence of the atomic displacement vector u. Okay? And this is the uh, uh, Za is the called the deformation potential. Za is the how the uh, um, band gap chain, uh, the conduction band Ec, okay, will change as a function of the volume change of the crystal. So if you squeeze the crystal, how the band gap will change, right? So this is a, is the deformation, called deformation potential. And uh, uh, now I'm going to use this 
Hamiltonian, per perturbed Hamiltonian, back into the uh, Fermi Golden Rule, and try to say what is this matrix, scatter matrix from I to F. Right? So this is the math part. And the way to do it is you have to, you say you are going to integrate over the volume your initial function and your final wave function. And uh, those are the wave functions of the electron because I'm looking at the electron gets scattered by lattice vibration, right? So this is the lattice vibration, how it's perturbed uh, the Hamiltonian of the electron. So physically, uh, uh, say what we have is that you can have an electron at certain uh, wave vector energy uh, coming in and interact with a lattice wave, and let's say at a certain uh, wave vector and uh, a certain frequency, and uh, this is, uh, uh, you can be combined, right? The energy of the phonon is given to the electron. So uh, you get the uh, uh, momentum energy, new momentum, new energy for electron. This is the inelastic process. The phonon disappear, right? You could also have the process where electron with a certain energy, momentum, and split it into another electron at a different energy, momentum with a phonon, create a phonon, right? So that's the interaction process. And, uh, Mathematically, what it will say is I want to plug this into the scatter matrix, but uh, I say for the, uh, um, uh, say, uh, let's say the wave function, right? I can use, if I know the wave vector, I can use the prime wave representation, right? The uh, wave vector, uh, the wave function is proportional exponential i k r. You, st you have energy frequency uh, also in there, uh, but uh, 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 this is uh, the energy part that is actually taken care of by this uh, delta function in the uh, Fermi Golden Rule. You could keep that everything together, you'll see electric coming out of this delta function. And uh, uh, now, if I look at the displacement of the atom, right? Of the displacement of the atom, again, uh, now you can go say this is a, uh, uh, each space, each point in the crystal could be have a different displacement, but uh, we did a Fourier transform before, right? Any function you can express in terms of sine and cosine, that's the Fourier series. This is the reciprocal lattice representation. So, rep so we can say different wave vector of the and uh, uq and uh, uh, exponential mass i omega t mass q dot r. Eventually, this uh, omega t will be merged into uh, the uh, energy, into part of the energy conservation. Uh, but I write it down here um, uh, because, to say, when we think about the energy of the lattice vibration, we need to uh, say, one half mv square, or say the, that that time derivative will give me omega. Okay, so this is a, a now if I go to plug in these two wave functions right into the scatter matrix, and uh, that's what uh, so the uh, scatter matrix from k to k prime. This is the electron scatter matrix wave vector, right? That means to uh, say I have one is a K, the uh, in either initial or final, the other is a K prime initial or final. And what I have then is this one could be written as a Z A over V. And uh, because I'm substituted the, in the Z A, the Hamiltonian, Ham uh, Porter Hamiltonian. And then I have, when I substitute the U, uh, the, uh, this H prime into the expression, I will have Q I Q times U uh, Q and uh, exponential mass I K prime.
prime plus q minus k times r you you see here i didn't carry that uh, minus i omega t term just look at the spatial term here okay so uh, the point i want to make is here if you look at this expression what really scatter phonon <coughs> uq so for phonon this is the plane wave this is the phonon wave vector i uh, say wave vector direction phonon wave propagation direction this is the lattice displacement direction right whether it's a transverse wave if it's a perpendicular to q or it's a longitudinal wave if it's in the same direction of q right so because of this deformation potential, at the end, my scatter matrix is the dot product of Q times U. Immediately tells you the transverse phonon here do not scatter electron, right? This because this is a zero. And it's a longitudinal phonon that will scatter electron. That's one. Secondly, if we look at this integration, plan wave integration, this will be rapidly sine cosine function average over the volume, volume right? Because this is exponential and uh, uh, let's say complex function is either sine or cosine. If you average sine and cosine over a large number, you know it's a zero. So unless those exponent is zero, the rest of those is all zero, right? So what you have here, Essentially, with this mass, you get the momentum conservation. Because uh, when this one is zero, or it's, uh, say, uh, 2 pi of reciprocal lattice vector, you get this one will not be uh, a zero function. So what you have is uh, a delta k prime plus q. And uh, uh, because I have this and the k, so what it, what it means is a k prime plus q minus k equals 0. That's the momentum conservation. So that's hk is the electron momentum, hq is the phonon momentum. So it came from laterally from this integration. And uh, uh, you, uh, in fact, uh, if this one is rather not 0, it equals to g. g is the reciprocal lattice vector we talked before. right? And that's still fine. You also, you integrate that you will not be zero because you get a two pi, I two pi. And, uh, but say for electron phonon, this seldom happen. It's a typically, uh, uh, you know, particularly in semiconductor, because the, uh, in semiconductor, this is a conduction band, and most of the electron is at this location. So it doesn't need to uh, say, uh, 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 with G is the reciprocal lattice vector pi over A, that's a very large momentum there. So that, the read of that process don't happen often. It's a typical normal process. OK. So uh, you, yeah, essentially, uh, you can also relate the Q, U velocity, uh, the amplitude of uh, the lattice displacement to the, uh, uh, say, how many phonons you have. Because this is all related to energy, right? One is the phonon picture. This is a, a displacement that is the actual moment there. So if you think about uh, the energy, because I want to relate this to temperature. So energy conservation, uh, say the, the, what, what we have is one half mv square, right? This is the, uh, the kinetic energy plus potential energy, one half kx square. That should equal to the total energy of the phonons. So if I do that, what, I ha what I'll have is one half rho of a omega square and the uq square. So this is a kinetic plus potential energy equals h bar omega nq. nq is the number of phonon at that temperature with this momentum. 
right? At the equilibrium, that's the uh, uh, Boltzmann statistics. Uh, no, the uh, Bose-Einstein statistics. Okay, so this one n q is a function of temperature omega at the equilibrium. So the reason I do this is so, so that I can write the final expression in terms of different temperature, what's the electron phonon interaction? Okay, I convert this displacement vector in terms of the, um, uh, the number of phonons. So if you do this, you go to say essentially write the scattering term, df dt, and uh, uh, this term, let's say, let's look at this first one. Uh, uh, we look at the phonon uh, emission. Uh, no, the phonon, uh, this term. So from K prime, uh, say absorber phonon, so annihilation process, go to another electron. And for this process, it is, uh, say, uh, when we uh, sum up this is the transfer, this is a one, right? From k to k prime or k prime to k, uh, you can write uh, different, uh, say, slight different forms. So what I have here is, this is a sum up or q, and the two pi h bar in the front, and the q square, and the h, uh, Z A square and two rho V omega and N Q. So this is the uh, scattering uh, matrix Fermi Golden rule. I'm applying Fermi Golden rule two pi H square, right? And then now when I scatter, I say. Uh, from how many electron I have at the k prime, because this is going from k prime to k. So that's the Fermi Dirac statistics I have. Okay, how many electron I have at this k prime. But then when I scatter into k, I have to see how many states are empty. This is the Pauli exclusion principle, right? So this is a k. And uh, uh, then I have this delta functions, k prime q to k. That's a, a result out of my uh, scatter matrix. And then I have my energy conservation, another delta of E. This is the final energy equals the sum of E prime plus H omega. So that's the E prime minus H omega. Very complex, but people actually did this, okay? And if you go to read papers there, sometimes you, uh, uh, people still do it. Electron phonon scattering is very difficult, and this is one of the four possibilities. So you actually have four terms like this. This term we talked about is uh, from K prime to K by absorber phonon. I can have from K prime to K to emit a phonon. So, right, this is a, both of this process increase the number of fo, uh, electron in the k state. I can have a reverse. The k is scattering out to k prime, right, by absorber emitter phonon. So there are four processes that give you the lab balance of the gain in the Boltzmann equation, that scattering term we talked about before in terms of two particle collision model. Now I'm doing an uh, electron phonon collision model. And the point is, uh, you see at the end, uh, you get uh, all those products. OK? That's temperature dependent. And uh, when you want to solve with the Boltzmann equation to solve for this distribution, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's a pretty tedious. But say the people have who have done a lot of work on this, was uh, say uh, Shockley, right? Shockley is the inventor of the transistor. You look at the papers; they study all those, uh, and there are other people like Conway, uh, uh, say very solid work. 
And uh, so the, uh, when you put this into Boltzmann equation, you, like I said, this is only one of the four processes. There are four terms. And in the 60s, so the people don't do computers. So this is all done analytically. Okay. So I actually repeated the derivation. If you read the book, I did it. I, had, I remember when I did the electron phonon scattering, and uh, I had a, a factor I couldn't reconcile. What's the difference? So I have a, f a factor of pi or pi one third difference from the derivation. So I put my result there. I couldn't find where it was the difference. OK. So now what happens is that the point, uh, so if you say these are all the scattering term, right? So I say, the, anytime you have carrier interaction, you can do this. If you want to calculate the, what's the photon absorption, you, your photon comes in as a perturbation, and it was excite the electron holes. And then you have to look at the, whether there's empty states for that uh, electron to actually be lifted from here to here. So those are all the scattering term you can write into the right-hand side for each process, the Boltzmann equation. And at the end, let's go back to the Boltzmann equation, df dt plus v dot r f dot, uh, say, uh, f over, uh, say, m. So this give me a. And uh, so I'll have to put the a, f. And this is the scattering term we say uh, for each process, you can write all those different, uh, say, uh, summation integrals, and you can solve it. Okay. And my next point is, uh, is that in the previous chapter, we used relaxation time. We couldn't deal with it. We just say, this is a, so what we did before is this is a minus df d0 over tau, right? But to say, uh, that's a, a little bit cheating, uh, a lot of cheating, right? It's a, it's a huge integral right in the very simple form. And uh, uh, you see, the, uh, if you read the uh, book in Electrical Engineer, very often what people do is F equals uh, even term plus R term. Uh, OK, uh, R, R term. OK? And uh, you, you substitute this back into this scattering integral, these this, this expressions. And you find out that uh, a df dc could roughly, df dt, the scattering term, can actually write into uh, uh, this, uh, this due to the uh, uh, even term and uh, the, due to the R term. And turns out the uh, R term could be roughly right into relaxation time. The even term cannot. What the even term represents is the inelastic scattering. Electron phonon, when they scatter, they lose energy. And so they have energy change, right? And for those kind of things, you cannot. In fact, you go do, do this uh, in, uh, say expression, you'll say it's roughly is Te minus Tp. It's the effective temperature difference between electron and phonon times this electron phonon scattering, the coupling, energy coupling coefficient. So for inelastic scattering, R rigorous speaking, the relaxation time is not valid. Okay, so we, we've done a lot of. I said uh, this approximation we did before. We saw Boltzmann equation. It was uh, say uh, uh, say really just uh, using those terms. But say when there is a difference between electron and phonon temperature, if you pass the current through a material. And you do some of those coefficients, you plug in, and you find out that in normal conditions, the difference between electron and phonon temperature difference is very small. So this term still 
It's not important in normal conditions. But it becomes very important you have a transient term, like uh, you have a laser. Uh, for example, we do experiment the uh, pump probe. I shoot a laser on the metal, and uh, I can observe very hot electrons. And uh, uh, so electron could be much hotter than full-on temperature. Or if you have a MOSFET, right? Say you have, uh, say MOSFET, you have a source, you have a drain term, you have a gate, and uh, it turns out that, that uh, electron temperature, uh, electron gain energy when you apply voltage, and on the drain side, they can be thousand degrees, okay, much hotter than the lattice. And uh, so for those kind of case, cases, you need to become more careful. And uh, uh, I will uh, talk more on, on those lines. Uh, 